worked in what's now called the Sackler Centre for Consciousness at the Sussex University. The whole thing was consciousness. And particularly things that go on beneath the level of conscious threshold in the mind is what I was interested in researching how that affects behaviour. But the thing is, when you mention unconsciousness, people always think of Uncle Sigmund. I don't talk about that. Because Sigmund thought that you saw something, had a conscious mind that would see things and interpret them in a sort of rational way as they were, but you had an unconscious mind, just like a mind within a mind that would interpret things in an entirely different and usually sexual way. But I'm not talking about that. So let's, let's get rid of Uncle Sigmund. Bye-bye. <laughs> so... You can tell I like PowerPoint, can't you? Yeah. You're very sad, man. You're very sad, man. Um, the kind of thing that I'm talking about is that it all happens through evolution. So you've got to think of the mind as a product of evolution and the things that it does. And what the brain doesn't like doing is it doesn't like thinking. So we can have this kind of way, it's called system two, where we can think, reason, cogitate, and uh, come up with reasoned and, uh, and things that we're aware of. But we do actually, our brain is designed to have lots of these mental shortcuts where things just kind of feel right. Think of it like a swimming cat. Cats can, can swim, but they'd really rather not. Brains can think, but they'd rather not. And you end up with these things called heuristics. Um, anybody know about behavioural economics that's sort of in the no, nudge units, government? No, it doesn't matter. Anyway, it's a thing at the moment. That's what I've been doing for 25 years. Um, and overall, there, if you look at it on Wikipedia, there are 190 of these little mental shortcuts that actually help us interact with the world in a seamless way, but also make us behave irrationally. Okay, so there are 190 on Wikipedia, and I should update it to have 191, because I have discovered this other heuristic that actually I'm going to talk about a bit with But some of these things, so for example, there are, there are some of these little functions. There's something called the mere exposure effect, which is the more you get exposed to something, the more you like it, you get to a peak, and then you dislike it. And the peak normally happens at around eight exposures. So, little hint, if, you know, advise your friends, if you fancy anybody and you want to ask them out at some point, um, try exposing yourself to them eight times before you do so. It's going to increase your chances. So, other things that come out of there are, are things like normative determinism, where people end up with, an, with sort of jobs that are a bit like their names. So, for example, I, I found this fantastic lawyer in, in America called Sue Yin. Um, there's a very good... Uh, this cheats because they're foreign. Um, which is, there's Mark Duman, who's a footballer um, in Holland, and this is a bit of a cheat, I know, but it's just funny because there was a, I love the fact there's a Russian hurdler called Maria Stepanova. Um, but, uh, and my favourite is this chap here, who is the head of urology in the sort of Somerset and Bristol area, and he's called Nicholas Burns Cox. Which brings us back to Willis. So, the story really, for me, started... Um, I, when I was finishing my PhD, uh, I was kind of doing what I shouldn't be doing and not writing up, and I ended up working in TV production. And I was doing a fetching and carrying job, but we got to film in Madame Tussauds. And they took us around all this. It was fascinating seeing them, you know, seeing them all created the waxworks and seeing all the ways in which the, the whole infrastructure in it worked. And uh, they sort of did, we filmed a few sequences, like we filmed them repairing, because apparently some of the waxworks get broken. Um, for example, Patrick Moore, remember old Patrick Moore? Um, he was in for repairs because some bankers had been in for a corporate do and had fancied a game of football and used his head, because it was the roundest thing they could find at the time, apparently. <laughs> but what fascinated me was the person and the waxwork that was most damaged. This is about 15, 20 years ago. The waxwork that was most damaged. Now you think it would be an evil dictator, or, or, or an evil dictator, or um, no. perhaps maybe a couple of annoying sort of soap opera stars, or maybe just one of those horrible plastic celebrities <laughs> that you just probably is more plastic, the waxwork is less plastic than the person themselves. But no, it was one of the greatest sportsmen this country has ever produced namely Linford Christie. Now, what happened with Linford was that he was famous for various reasons, apart from being Olympic gold medalist and world champion and um, being the first European to run in 10 seconds, extraordinary uh, uh, athlete, but he was also famous for something else. Because he sort of became rather good at running when the fashion was to start going away from shorts and vests to wearing lycra. And people kind of noticed that he was quite a well-endowed gentleman. And it was the one thing that people could not resist in Madame Tussauds, 
was that when they saw Linford, they couldn't help but give him a little squeeze in the old lunchbox. And so literally every six to eight weeks, I had to go and take him, take his waxwork upstairs, change his leotard and bring it back down again. And it's also fairly important to note as well that Linford is, of course, of African origin. And as I'm sure you were aware, there is this kind of story idea out there about the uh, largeness of gentlemen uh, of African origin um, in the trouser department. Well, this was sort of this kind of linked with something that I, I went to a lecture many, many years ago by this guy called Leon Kamen, and a lot of the work I'm sort of I've done is based on his idea. And he sort of knew this idea that essentially black guys have got big wigs. That's the idea. And he, he was sort of trying to question it, saying, is it really true? And he wanted to try and find some evidence to back it up. And if you go onto the internet now, you can find loads of measures of penis size across the whole of the world. But there's a problem with this data. I mean, as you can see here, you know, French are doing rather well. Note the French. Those are centimetres, right? Those are centimetres. Don't worry, they are centimetres. Good heckle. <laughs> but you get these very funny um, kind of anomalies whereby sort of Romanians are quite small, but the Hungarians are the largest in Europe. You know, so do we imagine that there are sort of hordes of Romanian women looking fondly over the border to, to Hungary? Well, probably not. Because the problem with all these data is that they normally come from kind of your top shelf magazine and write to their readers and say, oh, just if you'd like to have a little measure, send it in. And, and we'll, we'll collate it, and so it's all self-report. So essentially, these gentlemen would take measures in the loo, having a quick measure for themselves. And there are lots of problems with this kind of data. I used to teach statistics, and the problem is that you know it's self-report. So is it really true? There's no kind of definite way of saying it could be done. There's no kind of standard metric that people are using, unless of course you're using US patent, which has gone off the top, um, 734, something like that, which is they're using Archimedes principle to which measure the volume of the penis. This is actually a patented device. I don't know how it works, it should probably work that way or not that way, but never mind. Um, but also, again, there's a big issue about people being self-selecting. So if people are self-selecting about this stuff, it's probably people who think their will is quite big anyway who are going to write in. So what Leo came and realised is what you needed was a study where you had lots of men in the same place at the same time. You needed some kind of hierarchical structure so that everybody was forced into it rather than being self-selecting. You needed a scientist there, a professional, who would be able to take the measurements um, in a systematic way. And of course, you'd have to have loads and loads and loads of time on your hands, because quite frankly, there's far better things to do about worry about willy size. But he found one study, you know, came and found this study, it was from 1889, and it was the French Foreign Legion, who for some bizarre reason decided that they'd take loads of measurements of their, of the, their, their, um, uh, anatomy and many things, um, <laughs> of, and of course there was a broad range of eth ethnicities and broad range of um, uh, people. In fact, they, they just seem to be quite interested in each other's choppers. Sorry, that's the uh, that's the only that's the only <laughs> not <-head. laughs> But it came up with some interesting data, and the results were essentially you might learn about various things about willy size. Well, it's they found it's nothing to do with thumb size. It's nothing to do with uh, hand span. Nothing to do with that. It's also nothing to do with fingers, lots of hand things. It's nothing to do with that. It's nothing to do with foot size. Bad news for clowns. And it's also nothing to do with depth of voice. Interestingly, the depth of voice was... Um, I think Aristotle used to think that the genitalia was actually attached to the vocal cords. And as your genitalia drop, that's why your voice drops and stretches the vocal cords. But it's nothing to do with that. And also showed most importantly, it's nothing to do with ethnicity. And this wasn't surprising, because the reason why Leo Kamen kind of thought this is because he looked at other kind of um, references. And actually, this whole idea of black guys being with Willits is pretty sinister, because it comes from the slave trade. Because, of course, slaving, you know, the guys of the slavers were all good Christian men, and you wouldn't want to sort of, you know, subjugate and hurt another human being. So they got round it by this little intellectual sort of get-out clause by saying, well, actually, they're not humans, they're animals. And because they're animals, they can be treated differently, and to prove that they're animals, that means they've got, they've got a stronger libido, they are more rapacious, they are more likely to commit sexual assault, and because they've got these great strong libidos, they can't control them, and because of that, they've got, this is evidenced by the fact they've got big genitals. 
which of course makes no sense because there's no evidence of kind of testosterone or sexual drive and gender size. It's nonsense. And but Leon came on to did, did a bit more research. He found things like uh, there was evidence of the early um, the, the the early uh, explorers who would go into the sort of the, the new lands and they meet the native population and event, and after a sort of while of getting to talk to them, um, they sort of learn how to communicate and. These, these the sort of the, uh, the indigenous people said, you know, you never guess what we used to think. When we saw you coming through the, like, coming through the clearing the first time, those things that you were wearing, your trousers, that's right, yeah. We thought, right, we thought your limbs were so big, they would have to have, wear them to wrap them all around three times and tuck it all in for you. We thought, you know, so you work the other way around as well. Indigenous people actually thought that uh, you know, the white man had very large penises. So there's something weird going on here. Anyway. Leah Kevin never really got around to doing the study that I, I'll show you in a second. Um, but he came up with this idea that it might be something to do with fear and intimidation. Because there was other studies that showed that if you basically have two muscly guys and you've got one big muscly guy projection like this, you get closer to him, he seems big, strong and funky and great and lovely. But if you do it with a black guy, he becomes big, strong, muscly, but scary. And he kind of theorised that actually, basically, if you're scared of it, it's got to be big. That's what he theorised. And there was no evidence of this up until last year. Because a friend of mine in Brighton runs the Academic Archers Conference. And we thought it would be rather fun, this is the BBC webpage that it was, it was on, um, to do a test. Because obviously, I don't, I, anybody listen to the Archers? You, okay, right. There is one rule about Archers listening, it's like Fight Club. If you listen to the archers, you never talk about the physical attributes of the archers. This is like the one thing you, is, you never, never do, according to archers' listeners. So, we thought it might be fun to do a sort of test, to pick... I've never listened to it, so I had these kind of ten names, and then designed this little sort of study that was put out on, on uh, Twitter to the archers' fans, to do this kind of, you know, what do you think of how scary, intimidating, etc. the characters are. And then at the end, said, so, well, how big do you think their willies are? How big do you imagine them to be? And this got a fair bit of offense, but it, it made kind of the front page of the Archers website. And we got this perfect correlation <laughs> between fear and really size. So it's actual evidence that it's true. There is this weird heuristic, this weird mental shortcut that goes, they're scary, they've got big willy. And this kind of makes sense, because you think about sort of, you know, you think about people like uh, the shouty guy in the office always compensating for having a small dick. Well, actually, he's probably, you think he's got a big dick because he's in frightening, so you're just trying to do a bit of reverse psychology on yourself. The same with like big cars, big car, scary, tiny dick. It's the same, same principle. <laughs> and in America, big guns. Guns, <laughs> penis substitute all the way. And there are other people who do tend to sort of think it works around the other way as well. And what I think is fascinating as well and is that if this is a true thing, if this is a true mental heuristic, it isn't necessarily a modern thing, you should be able to find it in history as well. Priapus, if you look at the Priapic verses, he's quite a scary character, Roman god. And there's quite a few things, if you go back into Greek, um, uh, if you look at the Greek uh, depictions of the barbarians, they've all got big willies as well. And the Greeks and the Romans used to value beauty is in the, is in the small penis. A little bit to do with so sophistry there, but they had this kind of idea that the other, the different, had big willies, probably because they were scary. And this goes back to objects. So you can go back to Stone Age times. Those are hand axes. You could never use that. That's an unusable thing. But again, it's like sort of size, and it's this compensation. It's either like big car. Big hand axe, small dick. It's the same thing. You can measure it back then. Even back to the whole phallus, which is a the earliest depiction of the penis, which is 30,000 years old, was found in a cave in Germany. And um, I, I, I love archaeology, but they have no sense of humour. And they kind of think it's like sort of some votive thing or some religious thing. I, why, you know, it's kind of like a willy shaped rock. I mean, what would an unreconstructed male do with a willy shaped rock now, apart from hang it from his trousers and chase his friends? I mean, I swear that's what they probably did with it. Anyway. So why? Well, we don't really know, but there's some kind of evidence that you can sort of get from um, evolution. So if you look at body weight of humans versus chimps versus gorillas, they're kind of unique. Now. We are about sort of 12 stone-ish, chimps a bit bigger, gorillas up to 40 stone. If you look at penis size, 
Round about six inches for men, average. Smaller for chimps, tiny for gorillas. Ooh. And it's more to do with if you're that big, if you look like him, you don't need to attract a mate with a big willow. Whereas as we sort of evolved from here up to here, there was going to be an element of display. So somehow, that's the best theory there is at the moment, but nobody really knows. What I do love about when you look into this data is that when, you've, uh, when you look at the kind of willy size, it, it's testicle size, which is actually the interesting one, because that's testicle size for humans, gorillas, and chimps in the middle. Because chimps are really civilized creatures, and when a female comes on heat, they actually don't fight over the female, they just, bonobos especially, they just take it in turns and they pass on their genes by basically releasing the most genetic material. It's through my gorillas, tend to, uh, chimps tend to have rather large things. Anyway, but it's to do with sort of, this idea of fear as well goes into sort of, uh, uh, I, I did my PhD with a, with a very eminent professor who did a sideline in looking at the uh, psychology of um, sexual fetish. And he did this kind of, he did a test where he got people who were very dominant in their lives mm -hmm. and very passive in their lives to read kind of various sexual fantasies mm -hmm. and he found that essentially the one that kind of put you, made you feel the most uncomfortable was the one that turned to people on the most. And this sort of fits because you think about, you know, your Max Moberty kind of big powerful business firm, he liked to be subjugated. In that, that's what else is thing, and it's the one that makes you fearful, the one that makes you sort of slightly on edge, is the one that gives you the the, the kick, the more of the kick. So, all of this, as I say, I mean, apart from the study that I put in the middle, which was uh, I've done last year, there was a lot of theory going on here, especially about actual penis size. It, does it? What does it depend on? Well, about three years ago, this was the first proper, genuine study of actual willy size around the world by the British Journal of Urology, which they did in a proper scientific way. The first one since the, uh, uh, the uh, French Foreign Legion. And that's the data, that's the real genuine data um, that you get. There's probably a little bit of politics in there. I mean, I certainly know that the smallest willies in the world are North Korea. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But it, again, belied the idea that there was anything to do with race within there. So certainly that the idea of how black guys going to be willies is is a complete myth. Um, but I saw this and I thought, hold on a second, this is the, re this is the real data. We know what men report. This prompts the question, how reliable are men actually at reporting their own willy signs? We can measure, so I did a comparison. And as you can see, actually, men are quite accurate. We're quite honest across the whole of Europe. Do note as well, us British, there may be many things wrong with this country, but my God, when we take a tape measure into the loo and measure our willies, we are 100% accurate. <laughs> British men have many faults, but damn, when we measure our willies, we can pull it on. <laughs> but overall, actually, you know, as a kind of statistician, you look at that and go, that's actually not that bad. That's pretty good, you know, people are generally honest. Apart from the French. <laughs> <laughs> Monsieur, you've been busted. The French make a massive overestimate of their willy size. Ridiculous. Anyway. So, as I said, there's something to do with kind of display. And again, another study that came out a couple of years ago um, was done in Australia by a couple of guys who sort of um, wanted to work out how much willy size did actually impact on attractiveness. And they had these avatars and they manipulate various sort of body shape, willy size things. So essentially what they found is that tall had was an important factor. The main factor though was shoulders to hip ratio. If you have broad shoulders and skinny hips, that was attractive. If you had skinny shoulders and a fat bum, no chance. But basically if you were this guy with broad shoulders and skinny hips, then willy size did make about 20% difference in attractiveness. So there's a little bit to do with, this is why it's to do with when we stood up and we came on to uh, two feet rather than four. So there's some evidence, there's a little bit of kind of uh, help, but it's not exactly kind of like, you know, overwhelming. And by far the most important thing is shoulder to hip ratio, big shoulders and skinny hips. So, what have we learned from this venture to big willy? Don't trust the French. <laughs> If you want to do, get a jolly insect, do it in a scary place. 
And if you are a gentleman and you are worried about your woolly size, and it does something that you sly away at night and it concerns you, buy shoulder pads, not a dick pump. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. The, uh... I'm a proper psychologist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, does anybody, this is, uh, I suppose it's dangerous territory, isn't it, oh, to ask God. questions. Does anybody, yes, here yes. we are. Yes, I do, I do. <laughs> do you think generally a men who have small women's are definitely, they have problems, psychological problems, but men with big women's do not have psychological problems. They're quite happy wandering around in the is it a psychological thing with men? A couple of months ago, because I'm over from Brighton, and am I allowed to mention the C word here? Yes, I will. The catalyst. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah right. So the catalyst club. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, sorry, no, 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 the one in Brighton. <laughs> the one of these in Brighton. Um, <laughs> They, a chap came along and did a, uh, did a talk about uh, nudism, and he brought... Oh yeah, he, he did, did that yeah. here oh, right, uh, yeah. first, yeah, yeah. Oh right, yeah. Oh yes, yes, oh, we're yeah. a little yeah. Catholic, so. yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he do it in the nude? No, but they didn't allow that. He did it at both venues. He didn't send letters and did it here. Both venues said, no, 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 no. Oh, right. well, he, 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 was, he was, yeah. Yeah, they did it in the, in the buff. And, yeah, he did it in the buff in Brighton. And, and there were six of his colleagues who were in the buff as well. They've been hosing down the sink since. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, they weren't by any, not that I looked that closely, but it, yeah, it's hard to say. I, I, there, are lots of, in, there are lots of factors that impact on, on kind of mental health and behaviour and Willie's size could be one of them, but I, I would imagine there are lots of others as well. Um, and it's, and I suppose the, the general answer to that is, if you go into a psychiatric ward, you probably have that everybody measured as a, as a measure of something, because that's a bit like criminology. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is I don't know. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Uh, any, other, any other questions? Yes, Jeremy. Have there been as many um, studies and things about women's breasts, or is this just a male? I've got, to, I've got to answer that very carefully, haven't I? Because you can say something about Flip, like if somebody would give me a grant to study it, I'd be very happy to, but that would probably seem a little bit uh, off colour. Oh, oh, yeah. um, again, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, it's, one of these, it's one of these things where I, I will hold my hands up and say that I, it is one of these kind of patriarchal things. There's a chap I've given this talk on the same kind of uh, roster as, um, who gives a talk about animal vaginas. And whereas there's a huge body of evidence, academic evidence about animal willies, there's very little about, very little about animal vaginas. And I think it's probably a sign of the patriarchal nature of society that willies get a lot of attention and female anatomy doesn't. Mm. So that's probably the, it's, it's a, I'm not trying to be too politically correct, but I think that's probably the case. So it's, and it's, it's very hard to actually do any proper rigorous on the understanding of that without researching to that, without it becoming bastardised into something quite flip. So, I mean, I'm sure there may be some evidence of, I mean, I do know that having worked in my TV life, I worked on programmes to do with uh, a lot of plastic surgery, and the general consensus was that plastic surgery doesn't actually improve uh, mental health in most cases. So. If you extrapolate that, say a lot of that may have been breast enlargements, then that may not may imply that it doesn't really matter. I wonder how much um, evidence or research there is on because they can now enlarge penises now, can't they? So there is a chap in Germany who has done his own self enlargement, oh, and yeah. I think it's up to three kilos. Oh, oh three kilos! He's basically. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Hold on a second. It's if I've got, I, I, he might actually. I, I might have stuck a picture of the back end. Yeah, this, this is. Yeah, this, this is. This. I. I. I can do. I do. Can do. Uh, can do an hour on this. Don't worry. This is. This is, this is dictators. Dick and dictator. Yeah. Donald. Yeah. Donald Trump. 
Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, hand size, willy size, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Rubio came up with that. And it was on the bloody American whatever, anyway. Is he, is he going to be, is he going to appear? So he goes back, oh, yeah, don't, I'll, I'll, don't worry about it, I'll, I'll, if, I'll flip through. Um, this, is, this is all part of other bits that I do. No, that's the end of it. Oh, goodness. No, we're done. Anyway, yes, there's a, there's, there's, a guy, there's a guy in Germany who basically did his own penis enlargements by injecting silicon into his body. And it is now, he, he has to walk with a satchel like this because it is so enormous. And there are pictures of this, you can find them on the internet. And it's literally like, like this. And it's just a big bag of silicon. And it's, you know, it is I mean, it, it is, yeah, it, it's mm. going to go horribly wrong for him at some point. <laughs> Man, already not. Yeah, cool. Sorry. Um, has there been any research into the link with IQ or intelligence in penis cells? Not that I know of. I would have not have thought that there is any link with IQ, because IQ can depend on many, many different things. Um, there's a link with. Uh, do you know about the D2 D4 ratio? That's a good one. Look at your left hands. If you see my left hand, now just that my ring finger on my left hand is longer than my index finger. That's uh, because of the way when the brain is developing. Again, this is indicative rather than definite. But if your in if your ring finger is long, that's a sign. That ratio there is it's a sign of male brainness and if you've got a particularly long one it means you're probably on the autistic spectrum which i am but that is uh a sign of, but if they're the sort of same if there's an index finger is longer than the ring finger that's a sign of a female brain but, but yeah so so women should have an index finger which is around the same size or, sh or longer than their ring finger and men should have it the other way around but or, but it's an 80 20 split so 80% of men have female brains, so 20% of men have female brains and 20% of women have male brains. That's a, that, that doesn't answer your question at all. That's, a, that's a, another related fact, I know. It's a, a marvellous takeaway from the Babar It's a wonderful thing. Because I, I've actually, I've, I've, I'm a director of a company, we've just got a new chairman on board, and I was in the first board meeting with him on Friday, and I noted he's got a massively long index ring, so he's got female brain. Anyway, there we are. I didn't point out to <laughs> any any final questions oh, for Alistair before I, we... I've yes. studied men around the world. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am a male specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Having worked on cruise ships where there were thirty men to every woman, it was great ratio. But I've been traveling around the world for 47 years. And I definitely think men have a psychological problem if they have a small one. And men who are very relaxed and laid back are ones that have quite something <laughs> down there. I, have a, I did actually get shown one that was too big to actually have sex. I mean, he wanted to show me it, so just displayed this thing. And I said, okay, right, yes, it has very big. It is, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon, because I'm, I'm, I'm thankfully now past the, uh, the uh, dating social media thing, but the, the knowing people, who, younger people who still are, the whole dick pic thing is really fascinating. Because if, act, you know, if, if you go by what's attractive in what women find attractive, according to the data, it is this kind of shoulder-hip ratio thing, and silhouettes and outlines. Oh, the triangle. Yeah, the triangle. Yeah, and then the long legs. The triangle, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Whereas, whereas yes. it, and I just can't get my head around the idea that you just assume that people would just want to see something which probably doesn't look that attractive anyway, and then just kind of, yeah, and just send it to text. I don't get that. I just don't get that. Why people, why men would think they want to find that attractive? I genuinely don't understand it. Thank God I'm not dating anymore. <laughs> well, what about this program that's on television now, Naked Attraction? Ah, that's unbelievable. Maria. I think, I, 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 again, my, 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 my time in my time TV told me that there are a group of people who literally will do anything to be on TV. Yes. They, they are, yes. Somebody. It's close. Um,
Right. Uh, well, before we, <laughs> before we descend too much into the uh, into that line of uh, question, there could be a future bravado there somewhere, I guess. Um, can we thank Alistair for a fabulous?